Merci bien. <rire> Pour moi, c'est un grand plaisir d'être entre vous et à Paris. Euh, mais je regrette que je parle pas français assez bien pour dix minutes. Je suis fini. Au revoir. Um, I, I actually love coming to France. And um, I've been coming here now. So I think the first time I came was when I was 17. Uh, 19. Do you care how old I was when I came to France? I mean, I can... <laughs> if you wait, I'll check. I think I was 19. And I was saying to uh, some... Uh, we had lunch today with uh, the great people from uh, Synlab, uh, Florence and Delphi. And I was saying that when I first came to Paris, I was told... I was in a car. And I was told there was a campsite in the Bois de Boulogne. There isn't. <laughs> That's what I discovered. But the person who came out of the bushes in a short skirt <laughs> looked to me like she was coming from a campsite. So, so that was my first uh, entry to Paris. And I've been coming back ever since to try and <laughs> find that campsite. So, Uh, but it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here, and particularly to be among change makers uh, like this, and uh, to listen to. I thought these presentations were fantastic uh, this evening, and uh, and I especially enjoyed uh, Leopoldine. Is that correct to say, Leopoldine? Yes, and Tiber, who I met yesterday, and I was deeply impressed. I wish I had had half their confidence and insight at their age. Uh, actually. I wish I'd had half of it now <laughs> at, at, at my age. And the thing is, they can do it in two languages. It's a disgrace. So, but what I, I mean, I loved what they had to say, and I especially loved uh, what, well, all, all the uh, contributors were saying, but I love the name of Carolyn's school, the living school, because that's what they are. That's the whole point of this, I think, really, that schools are not uh, factories, although they're often treated as if they are. They're not... Uh, training camps, uh, although they're often treated as they are. There's a big difference between education and training. And I think we get it confused. Uh, I've, I've just published a new book, uh, as uh, Arno said, uh, here it's in, in France. It's called Trouver son élément. Ton élément. Which one is it? Which element are we finding? <laughs> son élément, yes. Yes, you can find your own, I don't care. But um, <laughs> Trouver son élément. And um, it's, it's about the, the nature of personal talent and how you discover it. And it's, I, I have to tell you, this book is fantastic. <laughs> You'd be foolish not to buy this book. <laughs> and buy it for your friends, if you want them to care for you in the long run. But I've since written another book called Creative Schools, which is just as good. And The, how do I do it? I don't know. <laughs> But I, I make a distinction there between learning, education, and training. Learning is what we're interested in. But the thing is that young people learn anyway, don't they? We are learning organisms. We come out of, into, the, into the world with a voracious curiosity to learn. I mean, think about learning to speak. How many of you have got children here? Okay, well, you know, if you've got young children, um, perhaps they're grown up now. Uh, I wasn't asking you personally. But <laughs> though I'm very, ple very pleased to hear it. But, <laughs> um, so at least somebody's child has grown up. This is very good in France. But, <laughs> but you, know, you know, if they're of an age where they're speaking, you didn't teach them to speak. You couldn't teach a child to speak. It's far too complicated. You know, they wouldn't have the time and you wouldn't have the patience. You know, it doesn't come a point when they're 18 months old where you sit your child down and say, we have to talk. <laughs> you know, or, or more specifically, you do. <laughs> and this is how it's going to work. 
you know, there are all these noises that we make. These are called nouns. They refer to things. Uh, there are other noises we make, which are verbs, which are ways of describing what we're going to do with these things that we've just named. And there are tenses here, where you just have a slightly different intonation, and this allows you to say what you have done within the past and things that you plan to do in the future. And don't worry about the subjunctive. Nobody understands that. You know, it's, it's a complete mystery to all of us. So <laughs> you don't teach them to speak. They learn to speak with your guidance, your encouragement, your support. You mentor them. But you don't teach them it. Uh, teaching is a deliberate process of facilitating learning. And some things we can teach people and some things we can't. There are many things we can teach our children. And some things we just hope they'll learn, and some things we hope they'll absorb through the conditions we create in our schools or in our families or our communities, uh, that they'll learn by example, that they'll learn because we are models for the things that we're talking about. Um, training is a subset of education. It's a specific form of education focused on learning particular skills. I was saying, saying earlier to Florence and Delphine that, that I remember when I was uh, at college, we used to have these earnest philosophical debates about the difference between education and training, you know, conceptually. Uh, but it was very easy to pin down when we realized that if, if you're a parent and your, your child came home from school and told you they'd had sex education, you'd be fine. If they came home and said they'd had sex training, you'd, <laughs> <laughs> you'd probably call the school, wouldn't you? And say, <laughs> I'm sorry, is that extra? The premise of education is that there are certain things that we, well, there are two really. One, there are certain things we want our children to learn that we think they wouldn't learn if we didn't put them in the way of it. <laughs> things that are too important. Cultural things that are too important to be left to chance. I mean, for example, there's a big debate, as they're not here right now in, in France, about the nature of the academic curriculum. The ministers made a suggestion that perhaps uh, the, some elements of French culture could be minimized or reduced in the curriculum to make way for other things, like, for example, perhaps not so much of an emphasis on Voltaire in the Age of Enlightenment, uh, perhaps a bit more on Islam. Well, that's a very important and interesting debate. But you know it's created very intense feelings. There's been a suggestion that perhaps Latin and Greek uh, could be pushed down the scale of priorities a little bit. Well, you know, that brings people out onto the streets because Culture is at the very heart of how people define themselves. The, the ideas, the concepts, the traditions, the, um, the historical formulations which define who we are now and in the present. So there's some things we want the curriculum to include which we think are essential. And there's a big debate about, the, about what those things are. But there are also some things that we include in education because we think they're too difficult to leave it to kids to figure out for themselves. Uh, I mean, Leopoldine and Tiber would work it out in five minutes, I'm quite sure, but, but things like calculus. On the whole, we don't think, well, let's just leave the children to work it out. You know, how hard can it possibly be? Well, actually, it's taken centuries of intense intellectual effort, and it's a lot quicker just to tell them how it works, and we think it's important that we should do that. So th there are two reasons of that sort, but there are other reasons for education. Now, um, Creative Schools is about that and about how to change the system and trouver ton element, son element. Don't shout at me. <laughs> Jerome is publishing the book. That's why I'm here. He dragged me along, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and Emmanuel has made the whole thing happen. These people here who are fantastic. Uh, but they promised not to speak to me if I didn't come out tonight. <laughs> no, seriously, they, they've done a great job. But, but a uh, son element is about uh, some of the principles of personal fulfillment that lie at the heart of all of this. But uh, Jerome challenged to say what we think education is for. He's right to ask that question because there are all sorts of debates about education which go often up the wrong direction. Because people start talking about the wrong thing first. They talk about content first, or they talk about pedagogy first, or, or sadly, they talk about assessment before they talk about everything else. And Jerome is quite right. We should talk first about what it's for. Why are we doing this in the first place? There's a philosopher called Walter Bryce Galley, or there was. He's dead. He was good, but he wasn't that good. That's what I'm saying. So. Well, <laughs> Walter Price Galley 
talked about essentially contested concepts, by which he meant there are some ideas which are inherently restless. Uh, we're not going to pin them down and all have a final agreement because it's in the nature of them that they're volatile. Uh, for example, the concept of liberty. We think we know what it means until we start to talk about it because it turns out to mean different things for different people and probably always will. Justice is one, of, one such concept. It's a, it's a, it's a concept which is inherently um, difficult and awkward and means different things to different people, although we may feel we know what it is until we, we start to drill down. And I think education is one of those. There are all kinds of inherent arguments about what education is for and therefore what should be in it. So my work is based on a view of what education is for, and I want to tell you what it is. Um, the premise of it is exactly caught up in what Tiber and Leopoldine and Caroline were saying, or implying. Uh, they were all talking about savoir-être, uh, about uh, knowing how to be. The premise I work from is this, <clears throat> that we all live in two worlds which are separate. There's a world that exists whether or not we exist, that came into being long before you did and hopefully will be there long after you've gone. It's a world of other people, of objects, of things, of historical events and circumstances, of other cultures, uh, the physical world, the world of other people and their comings and goings and their dealings. It's a world that's uh, whether or not you are, exists whether or not you exist. It's the world you live in, but it would be there anyway. And a lot of our time in school is spent helping children understand that world, the world around them. But there's another world that exists only because we exist, because you exist, the world that came into being when you did, the world of your private consciousness, the world of your inner sensibility, the world of your interior life, the world that came into being only when you did and exists only because you exist, and the world that will go when you go or transition if that's what your belief system takes you towards. It's the world in which the psychologist R.D. Lang once said, in which there is only one set of footprints. And our life is spent in that world, and we see the outer world through that world. We live in both worlds simultaneously, but many of the uh, problems we experience in the outer world originate or are exacerbated by disturbances in our inner world. And many of the problems for education, I think, are that we don't address properly the child's inner world, the world of their interior life, the world of who they are, the world, indeed, through which they relate to everything around them. And we, we ignore it, not deliberately, but systematically. We do it by having a curriculum that's focused only on academic study, for example. Academic study is quintessentially focused outwardly. I mean, academic study is often taken to be a synonym for intellectual. I think that's a terrible mistake. Um, I, I was in a, um, uh, an education office in Austria a while ago, and I was speaking to the uh, director of education, and I was making the point that uh, human intelligence takes many forms, and uh, it, it's, it's not confined to academic or scholarly work. And he said, well, where is the evidence of this? And, you know, we were sitting in a 16th century castle <laughs> in a large office that was lined with intricately carved oak panelling. There were beautiful hand-woven carpets on the floor. We're surrounded by modern and classical paintings and Mozart was playing through an Apple sound system. <laughs> I said, it's all around you. Look, at, uh, look around you. Academic study is essentially, it's very important, but it's a certain type of deductive reasoning, a certain sort of scholarly critical activity largely transacted in words and some forms of mathematics. But to reduce the whole of human intelligence to the ability to do academic work is an appalling error, isn't it? You know, if all you had was academic ability, you couldn't have got out of bed this morning. In fact, there wouldn't have been a bed for you to get out of because nobody could have made one. You could have written about the possibility of one, but, but nobody could have constructed it. But for historical reasons, our education systems are obsessed with this idea. So we ignore it that way and also we ignore it because we don't allow into the curriculum the sorts of interpersonal uh, communications and uh, interactions which are so essential to forming our inner lives. So uh, my take on education is this, that the aim of education, I want to satisfy Jerome here on this point before he leaves, thank you, is this, that the purpose of education is to help students understand the world around them and the talents that lie within them 
so that they can become active, compassionate citizens and fulfilled individuals. And that leads to a series of goals. They are economic, cultural, social, and personal. And they're all connected. That's really the point. And I think our current systems of education <clears throat> inherently misfire on almost every point. Economically, we're preparing our children for a world that is fast disappearing and not preparing them for a world that's fast emerging and in many ways actually within us. Socially, our children learn in groups but not as groups. And we fail to recognize that we have to model the societies we want in our education system. For example, we talk a lot about democracy, but our schools are very far from democratic. And it was John Dewey who said this, that every generation has to rediscover democracy. I live in America now, which is trying to export democracy around the world, and it simply doesn't know how to do it. I, w I live in Los Angeles, and we had an, an election for the mayor two years ago, it was now. We had a 15% turnout at the polls. This was in a year that was the centenary of the death of Emily Davison, who died under the hooves of uh, the king's horse at Ascot um, in the fight for women's suffrage. People have died literally for the vote. Uh, I mean, not least and perhaps foremost in this country. Uh, but then people don't bother showing up to vote at all nowadays. And partly because people have cultural amnesia. They forget that, that democracy is not a gift. It's a struggle. And our schools need to model the principles of it for it to happen. We face enormous challenges, and we've heard them set out. Some of them are economic. Some of them are environmental. There was a great program, actually, on the, uh, the BBC a couple of years ago about how many people can live on Earth. It was called How Many People Can Live on Earth. It's, uh, the BBC is very good at titles, is what, <laughs> what we've discovered. A bit literal for some people's taste, but there it is. But there are now seven and a half billion people on the Earth, and they did the figures. We all need food, fuel, and water. Uh, the way we currently consume these things, if everybody on the Earth consumed at the same rate, it said, as the average person in Rwanda, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of about 15 billion people. There's obviously a limit, and that's it. We're, we're seven and a half billion now, the biggest generation of human beings in the history of humanity. But we don't all consume as they do in America or in North, Northern Europe. They said if, the, if, the ho if everybody on the Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in North America, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.5 billion. So we're sort of five times past that already. So if everybody wants to live as we do here in West, sorry, Western Europe and in North America, by the middle of the century, we'll probably need about four more planets to make it work, which we don't have. Uh, now, the interesting thing is all, this, all these crises are, in a way, caused by human creativity. But among the most critical are these. The, the, we, ch we face environmental challenges, we face economic challenges, but some of the most serious challenges we face on the planet are cultural. They're to do with the deep divisions in the way we all see the world. And this is just something I want to get to and finish with. Um, we do need to redesign our education system. A lot, of, a lot of what we do is predicated on old habits of mind and old reflexes of institutions. And we do things this way because we've always done them, and we're in command and control mode to try and keep it that way. We think if we can just shore the system up, it'll be resilient to change. It simply won't. It'll be blown down, I think. We have to create an entirely different sort of system based on different principles. I think, and Ashoka, uh, I know, agrees with this, is that we ought to be building our education system based on a different idea of competencies, and then that'll help us decide what sort of curriculum, what sort of teaching, what sort of assessment will work best. There are several of them, but let me just mention a couple I think matter. One competency our schools should be encouraging in schools, in our children, is curiosity. Children are naturally curious, and it's curiosity that is at the root of many of the achievements of humanity. Uh, sadly, what happens is children go to school full of curiosity and vitality for learning, but they start to lose it quite quickly after we start to educate them, because the rhythms of education jar with the dynamics of natural curiosity having to learn things at certain times for certain amounts of time. Creativity is fundamental to human flourishing. It's not some eccentric or marginal capacity. It's really what distinguishes from the rest of life on Earth. We, all of us, actually live long before Steve Jobs came to the Earth. Human beings always did live in a virtual world. We live
We live in virtual realities, by which I mean we live in a world of our own creation. We live in the world of ideas and theories and beliefs and faith systems and culture. And culture shapes a great deal of what we do, but we have to recognize that these skills of creativity not have to be honed. We may have them, but we need to cultivate them. Compassion is a third and vital form of uh, competency. I did an event in uh, Vancouver a few years ago. It was a peace summit with the Dalai Lama. Uh, it was in Vancouver. Uh, it was called the Vancouver Peace Summit. <laughs> it was organized by the BBC, I think, <laughs> looking back. <laughs> but the, the guest of honor was the Dalai Lama, and I was facilitating this opening session. And um, by the way, I had to introduce the Dalai Lama which is a challenge. I was worried. I mean, Arno had to introduce me, but I had to introduce the Dalai Lama. I mean, the Dalai Lama is the head of a faith tradition, or sorry, I should say a wisdom tradition, that is based on reincarnation. And, uh, you know, the idea is the same spiritual being uh, reincarnated in a different body. And this has gone on for over 2,000 years. So there's a lot to get in, you know, to an introduction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before I get to... So, and then I thought, I don't have to introduce him. Because I thought anyone whose name starts with the... <laughs> you can relax, can't you, socially? <laughs> really? I think you can relax in most social settings at this point if your name starts with a definite article. So, which Dalai Lama are you? That would be the. So, <laughs> he was fantastic, actually. He's fantastic. Uh, he was asked a question at one point, and well, he asked lots of questions, but there were 2,000 people there, and at one point, uh, somebody asked him a question, and it took a long time to think about it. It felt like a long time. It was maybe a minute, I don't know, but on the platform, that's a long time. And he was sitting cross legged on the throne, and uh, and he looked very thoughtful, and I got worried. I thought perhaps he'd gone off, you know, he's meditating. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> Your Holiness. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> Do that on your own later on. You've got eternity. So... <laughs> We're on a bit of a schedule here. Anyway, he asked him this question. And then he, he let, and we're all sitting there thinking, this will be fantastic, you know. And then he leant forward. I thought, here it is. It's coming. <laughs> and he said, I don't know. <laughs> I thought, what do you mean you don't know? You're the Dalai Lama. You know what I mean? We don't know, but we don't have the definite article in our name. <laughs> so... We just have the indefinite article, A. Ken Robinson. <laughs> so, <laughs> could be any Ken Robinson, couldn't it? You are the Dalai Lama. So, but he said, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. What do you think? See, it's such a simple thing, isn't it? But I love that. It seemed to me so uh, simple, and yet, as most profound things are, uh, elegant and profound. I mean, it was a very simple thing. He was just saying, look, I haven't thought about it. What do you think? Now, look, here's one of the world's great teachers who's perfectly happy to say he doesn't know. And it said, just says two things, really. One is that, of course, nobody knows everything. Nobody can. Knowledge is a collective fabric, and we constantly weave it. It's still evolving, still changing, still being revised. Uh, and secondly, what it shows is the really great teachers are also students. They're great learners. They are open always to learn. And you know, the gesture of it was that education is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. And that's something we've always known, but we now live in education systems where it's seen as a one-way traffic of information from full minds to empty minds, and it's wrong. But he talks a lot about empathy and compassion, and these are vital values at the heart of what Ashoka is doing. And I, I think of empathy, as we all do, as the ability to go into somebody else's point of view, to feel as they may feel, and to see the world as they may be experiencing it. It's the child of imagination. And it's interesting, it's the one thing that we start to quell in times of conflict. As soon as we find ourselves in opposition, what our leaders are prone to do 
is to ask us to shut down empathy for the people we oppose. And it's only when we do that, when we turn empathy down, that we find that human beings are capable of doing things that are otherwise unimaginable to each other. Compassion is really, so to speak, the active version of empathy. It's like the executive wing of empathy. Because you'd be empathy all day long. You could be looking at things and say, oh, isn't it awful? God, that must be terrible. I do empathize. But, <laughs> but what else is on? And, but with compassion, you're committed. Compassion is not just feeling it, but acting as a result. Taking steps to make your feelings known and to try and relieve the pain that other people are suffering. Uh, so compassion is vitally important. And the other one I just want to mention quickly is collaboration. And Christine uh, mentioned this, that collaboration is fundamental. And we saw it in, I thought that was a fantastic film, by the way, you know, moving the tree away. Isn't it? It's a yeah. wonderful, wonderful small film. Uh, captures something very important. Our school systems are sadly based on the opposite. They're based on competition. Uh, schools competing with each other. Teachers being forced to compete with each other. Children being forced to compete with each other. And when we all know that the only thing that really gets the job done properly is collaboration. I don't mean competition has no place. Of course it has a place. But, but collaboration is where we multiply our efforts and achieve something collectively that would be inconceivable for a single individual to achieve. And the truth is we live our lives collaboratively most of the time. We live in communities which are mutually dependent. This great city depends upon millions of people doing things in some orchestrated and collective way for it to function at all. So the point is to say that our school systems are in many key respects outmoded. We do need to transform them. We need change makers to do it. We need to act collaboratively. And I think with all of these things, curiosity, compassion, creativity, and also with a sense that, that as you said earlier, the job is achievable if we, if we make a combined effort to make sure it does succeed. There was, um, for my money, this has implications for the curriculum, for teaching, for assessment, for all of that. I mean, there's hard work to be done in figuring those out. And I, I tried to make my contribution in the various ways I have over the years, and particularly in this latest book. But I think at the heart of it is there's an important shift here we need to make. We need to change metaphors. We tend to think of education as some kind of standardized, standardizable process, like an industrial process with products. You know, the products are children uh, who are learners and who have learned things and they've been prepared for the world. I think this is a terrible mistake, by the way. Education is not, in a full sense, preparing kids for the, the life they're going to lead when they leave school. They're alive now. I mean, look at Leopoldine and Tiger. You know, they're alive, vibrant human beings right now. It's not preparing them for something later on. It's helping them live the lives they're having at the moment. And if we do that properly, that will be a preparation inherently for the lives that they were going to have. So the metaphor, I think, has to shift. We have to think of education and learning as organic processes, that human beings are organisms. We're living creatures. We evolve. We're, we're born full of possibility, full of potential, and we're all a work in progress. Every one of us, no matter how close you are to the end of your life, you're still evolving. And our kids are born with fantastic capacities. Whether we, they develop them and realize them is a question of the, op the conditions we provide and the opportunities that we give them. In the Element books, I talk about all sorts of people who uh, have led a life which has been deeply influenced by other people who've created the right conditions for them. Uh, I, I mentioned this one finally. Uh, my wife is a great fan of Elvis Presley. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something of an understatement. There are three of us in this marriage, really. And uh, fortunately, I'm alive. So, so that works to my advantage. And, you know, but honestly, 30 years, the same look of disappointment at breakfast. You know, it wears you down. I was like, <laughs> oh, it's you. Yes, he's dead. But <laughs> Elvis Presley went to school in Tupelo, Mississippi. And he wasn't allowed in the glee club, glee club at school. They said he would ruin their sound. Elvis Presley. I know of all kinds of examples of people who've done brilliant work who, as you were saying earlier, were discouraged from doing it at school, but they had the resilience and the fortitude to continue with it. Well, not, not everybody has that. Uh, talent is often like that's natural resource. It's buried deep. And we have to help people fathom it and forage for it and create the conditions for it to flourish. And that's the challenge for our schools, to create conditions for growth in our school. And if we do that, 
We still won't be able to predict the future. We won't be able to anticipate it. We can't exactly control it. But we will be in a better position to, to live a future that will make sense to us and to our children, to anticipate some of the great challenges and to bring all of our resource and talents to bear upon them. It's what um, H.G. Wells, the science fiction writer, meant when he said that civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. I think it is. And there are times when it looks like catastrophe may be edging out in front. So this uh, undertaking that Ashoka has committed itself to of change makers in education, I think really couldn't be much more important. It's the, not just the way we cultivate our children for their lives, but it's how all of us need to face the future. There was a wonderful quote from, do you know the, the writer Anais Nin? Anais Nin made a lovely comment. She said of her own uh, creative growth, she said, there came a time, it's a little poem called Risk. It's attributed to her. She said, there came a time when the risk of remaining tight in a bud was greater than the risk it took to blossom. I love that because we spend an awful lot of time in our schools, perhaps accidentally, sometimes deliberately, suppressing talent. And it's the process of suppression that creates most of the problems we end up trying to cope with. And if we were to change the system to make it positive and affirmative, many of the problems would be converted into advantages. And I see it in great schools all the time. These are the schools that Ashoka is celebrating here tonight. They're the ones that they will continue to celebrate. There was a wonderful quote from Benjamin Franklin and I think it underpins this, uh, this movement. He said that there are three sorts of people in the world. I always love categories like this. Uh, anyway, there are just three for this purpose. Uh, I once read a sociological book uh, which said there were 14 types of people. I think there was a 15th they discovered just out, outside of Austin. I'm not sure, but, <laughs> but it said there are three types of people. This is Benjamin Franklin. Those who are immovable, those who are movable, and those who move. And you know what it means? In every system, there are people who are just there like a rock. They're not going to change. They don't see the point. They don't like it. And it's not going to happen. My advice is leave them alone. Don't waste your time on them. Uh, they'll go away eventually. The waters will swell around them, uh, stimulated by the people who are moving. But there are people who are movable, people who are open to change and want to hear the argument. They're susceptible to it and would like to be persuaded, and it's our job to do it. And they're the people who will come along on the journey. But the but then there are the movers, the people who see the future, see the problems of the present, and can see a path between the two of them, uh, the movers. And my view of it always is that if enough people move, that's a movement. And if the movement's strong enough, that's a revolution. And that's what we want. Thank you. Thank you.